April 15, 2012, Farmington Hills, Michigan. 19-year-old Tucker Cipriano and his new friend, 20-year-old Mitchell Young, are high on synthetic marijuana. Tucker, a troubled kid from the time he was adopted, has decided he wants to murder a family for money and leave town never to be seen again. After several attempts that night, Tucker decides the family he should kill is his own. The incident that night shocked a community and left two kids charged with murder, each pointing the finger at the other. This is Tucker Cipriano, a family torn apart. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. back everybody yes welcome 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 and and i know you'll appreciate this one babe okay welcome to our native american friends and especially the cherokee nation yes yes my people yes they are you have some cherokee blood in you yes <laughs> de dani las di de nani las di de dani las di that's wonderful there i love go. that absolutely thank you very much shout out to all the native americans out absolutely. there absolutely my grandmother fam- i got family in north carolina it was cherokee indian yep well wherever you're listening to the podcast be sure to subscribe please leave us a like rate us or write us a review yep. and if you're watching on youtube hit that subscribe button below Yes. If you want more true crime, please join our closed Facebook group, the H2H In-Laws and Outlaws. Yep. Type it in on Facebook just like that or go mm-hmm. to our website at hitchtohomicide.com and you can find a link there. Yes. We've also made this handy dandy QR code right here. Yes, so you it can is. scan it and join in the fun. Very handy dandy. We love our folks. Yes, we do. In the in-laws and outlaws. That's our family. It's fun. Just a reminder, we have a new space on our website. If you want to share with us your own true crime story, your brush with true crime. Yes. Be sure to share yours and we just might talk about it on the podcast. There are lots of them coming in. I love it. Yeah. Well, this story today is so tragic and scary. It's a parent's worst nightmare. Man. Before we get started, let me thank some sources used for today's podcast. Murderpedia, the Detroit Free Press, Channel 4 News, the Just Thought Lounge, the Oakland Press, Michigan Bar Appeals, MLive.com, Patch.com, Medium.com, and CBS News. All right. Well, you ready? I am. Let's do it. I want you to meet the Cipriano family. Now, if they actually lived in Italy... They would be the Cipriano family. Be- Cipriano. Because it's C-I-P-R-I-A-N-O. But they go by Cipriano. I double-checked it. Okay. Robert, or Bob, as everyone called him, was born on November 30th, 1959. That's a good year, isn't it, Rob? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Vintage. <laughs> v- vintage and <laughs> fabulous. His parents were Salvatore and Eleanor Cipriano. He was a number three in a family of six. Wow. He graduated from Bishop Borges High School in the Detroit suburb of Redford, Michigan. When he graduated, he attended Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant. Okay. On September 17, 1988, Bob married the love of his life, Rosemary Trahan, or Rose. Okay. Gotta gotta marry the love of your life, honey. Absolutely. (laughs) Valentine's Day is just around the corner. (laughs) I I guess I should start thinking about that. You better. (laughs) Just kidding. Bob and Rose, in love, made their home in Bay City, which is northwest from Detroit and inside the mitten where the thumb meets the hand Mm -hmm. near Lake Huron. Do you like how I described That's Chris's geography lesson (laughs) for the day. Inside the mitten where the thumb meets the hand. Well, for an idiot like me, it works. <laughs> <laughs> As I, you know, what geography is not my thing, but I tried. 
Bob loved sports. He was a runner. He ran marathons. He did triathlons. But he also played in both softball and basketball leagues. Okay. At some point, the family moves to Farmington Hills, which is a northwest suburb of the Detroit area. It's very nice, very safe, very lovely neighborhoods. Okay. He worked for Dearborn Public Schools after working in the business office for Oakwood Hospital. Yeah. Five years after Bob and Rose were married, they adopt a baby boy born on April 5th, 1993. A baby boy who was abandoned by his mother. No. Four days later, Bob and Rose took the baby boy home, naming him Tucker Robert Cipriano. Okay. A year later, Bob and Rose welcomed a set of fraternal twins, boys, hmm. Salvatore, named after Bob's father, okay. and Tanner. Now, was that their natural kids or did yes. they adopt? Okay. Nope. These, they, they had these two twins. Gotcha. And kudos to Rose for carrying twins. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Wow. All you mamas out there that have multiple births, my hat is off to you. Yeah, I don't know how Octomom did it. Oh, my gosh. Let's, don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. Next. Then 10 years later, Rose and Bob welcomed a little girl into the family, Isabella. I think they called her Belly, which I thought was very, very sweet. That's cute. Rose worked at the YMCA. She was an avid swimmer, and she taught fitness classes. And Bob worked for the public school system. Both of these parents are in shape and fit. Hmm. And all the Cipriano kids played sports, even Isabella, who played softball, I believe. Yeah, they're just an athletic family. Very much an athletic family. Yeah. I mean, just nice, wonderful, happy. Everybody loves this family. Right. Bob and Rose were huge supporters of their kids, and Bob coached and loved seeing his kids play sports of any kind. Bob and Rose loved their family, and even though Tucker was adopted, they never treated him any differently than the biological kids. They're all one big family. Of course, yeah. But Tucker had problems. His parents took him out of regular school pretty early on because he was having trouble learning. So he goes from public school to private school. And by the time he's in second grade, Tucker is diagnosed with ADD and Rose was driving him to and from Ann Arbor more than once a week to get treatment. Wow. But while Tucker is struggling growing up, his two younger brothers are thriving. Mm. They were both really smart and very athletic. Everything that Tucker seemed not to be. Right. And by the time Tucker is 16, he's getting into trouble. In May of 2009, Tucker is arrested as a juvenile for possession of drugs, and he is placed on supervised probation. Wow. Now, you're going to find that as he gets into trouble, he really is sort of thrown some softballs because I think it's because of who his family is, and I think that they think this is a good kid. I mean, this is, this is somebody who's redeemable. Right. But they don't throw the book at him. In fact, there's an article, I think, in the Detroit Free Press that just basically said, this kid got a pass a lot. Wow. Well, they probably thought the parents were going to, you know, uh, reprimand him and, and discipline and him. And they and did. Sure, yeah. And they did. And his mom, Rose, wanted to know how to best deal with Tucker, how to help him. So she went to classes on substance abuse to understand what her son was going through. Gotcha. Then on June 4th of 2011, he's arrested for possession of cocaine mm. and is released from jail on a $5,000 personal bond. Wow, he's but, going downhill quick. Yes, but while he's on bond, he's arrested 12 days later as a minor in possession of alcohol and is sentenced to 30 days in jail and one year probation. Wow. So that's his third offense, and he's only going to jail for 30 days. And they don't have the three strikes you're out. I don't know what they have, but he's still, I mean, he's still a juvenile. Well, yeah, true. Okay. But he's released early. And by August 18th of that same year, he's arrested for retail fraud and minor in possession of alcohol where he blew twice the legal limit. Gee whiz. He pled guilty to the possession charge and his probation is extended. So no jail time. We're just extending your probation. Yeah. Now, apparently by this time, he's not really living with his parents, and he's dropped out of school. He just kind of stopped going to class. Hmm. 
And there were indications that he was stealing from his mom and dad to fuel this drug and alcohol purchases, whatever it is that he's buying. Where was he living? Well, he's living in hotels and he's couch surfing. And there's a woman, her name is Christine Frederick, who's recovering from some type of brain surgery. He lives with her from time to time. Okay. These kids have nowhere to go. And he heard about her through some of his friends. Now, I have a hard time saying he had nowhere to go. He could have gone home. Yeah. He just needed to straighten up his act. Well, and he knew that if he went home, he'd have to abide by their rules. Consequences. And consequences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Families have rules. Yep. Actions have consequences. My house, my rules. <laughs> <laughs> Who you quote now, honey? <laughs> <laughs> That's Chris's rule. <laughs> How many times did the kids hear that? <laughs> my house, my rules, even as adults. Yeah. And what's the rule at the dinner table? No phones. No cell phones at Chris's dinner table. Mm. Yep. It's a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> That's my time. It doesn't matter how old they get. doesn't matter how old. And we love it. It's the best time we yeah. have together. Nobody has a distraction. It's just us. Yep. So according to this woman, Christine, that he's kind of living with off and on, right. she thinks he was on the right path because he, he didn't go out. He didn't leave the house because he didn't want to, quote, be around any bad influences, end quote. Hmm. And I don't know if I buy that because he's yeah. still getting into trouble. <laughs> yeah. September 17th, he's arrested for breaking and entering and being a minor in possession. This is all in his senior year of high school. Wow. I already said he stopped going to school, right. and eventually he just drops out. Okay. Then he pleaded guilty in October to one count of possessing a controlled substance, which is a four-year felony Wow. from the June 11th arrest. And then on December 15th, Oakland County Judge Michael Warren sentenced him to 153 days in jail with 55 days credit for time served and two years of probation. Jeez. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is they were giving him these light sentences for these offenses. And when he's serving this time, he actually wrote to the judge and asked if his sentence could be reduced to probation if he would join the Marine Corps. Mm. Okay. And on February 1st, 2012, the judge says, I'll think about it. I don't know if he actually tried to join the Marines or not. But when he is released, he's ordered to report to his probation officer twice a month. Okay. But while he's on probation, he's worried about violating it and having to go back to jail. Mm -hmm. So instead of using cocaine, he became a fan of a synthetic marijuana that at the time was legal. It's no longer legal. Right. And it was sold at gas stations. Oh, I remember that, yeah. It was called K2 or Spice, as yeah. it's sometimes referred to. Right. You could do Spice, and it wouldn't show up on a drug test. Hmm. But it is a scary drug. What's the effects of it? Some of the effects of the drug are familial discord, check. Destruction of interpersonal relationships, check. check. Irreversible cognitive impairment, I'm already going to tell you, check. Okay. Stroke, seizure, heart attack, self-harm, suicidal ideations, psychosis, and death. Other than that, <laughs> gee whiz. It can cause hallucinations, delusion, paranoia, confusion, altered perceptions, and depersonalization. Wow. This is the drug that Tucker is doing. Man. And Tucker's not living at home. He's on the streets. He's couch surfing. But it's around the end of March and the beginning of April of 2012 that Tucker meets another homeless kid, Mitchell Young. Hmm. Mitchell Jordan Young is born on January 16th, 1992. Mitchell's nickname, I think he gave it to himself, is Roderick. I'm going to call him Mitchell. I think Roderick was his, like, street name. I'm going to call him Mitchell. I'm going to call him by his given name. Of all the names that you could choose. Why, Roderick. Why Roderick? I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to say. I too. mean, and he's a young guy. Yeah. He was born in 1992. Hello, I'm Roderick. Yeah. <laughs> no I don't think he uses <laughs> the uh, British accent, but yeah, <laughs> Roderick. It, Sorry to all of. the Rodericks out there. Yeah. Hey. Own it. But if your name is Mitchell and you live in the Midwest, you should probably stick to Mitchell. The story is that Mitchell, who's never been in trouble that I could find, is homeless and living out of his truck, or he is also couch surfing to survive okay. while he works 
at like a fast food or a quick service restaurant. All right. And he's trying to save enough money to go to college. And according to Mitchell, his mother kicked him out of the house because he didn't get into college. What? Yeah. Wow. And according to him, he was applying to MIAT, the College of Technology or Michigan Institute of Aviation and Technology. Don't know if that's true or not, but I wanted to give you what I found out while I was researching. Sure. I will grant you this. Mitchell Young had a tough upbringing. He had a stepfather who beat him and was abusive. Tucker Cipriano did not right. have a tough upbringing. Yeah. But Mitchell and Tucker start hanging out together with Tucker's BFF, his best friend, Ian Zinderman. And they're all smoking K2. Hmm. Tucker's younger brothers are doing really well in school. And Tanner is actually on course to be the valedictorian of his class. And it should have been Tucker's senior year. He's a year older than Sal and Tanner, the twins, who are in their junior year at Detroit Catholic Central High School. Okay. Tucker has been living in the two-lane motel in Farmington Hills. Then he moves to the Park Motel, also in Farmington Hills. And after two visits with his probation officer, he never goes back. Hmm. And they never go looking for him. Really? And his parents can't keep track of him. So he has no warrants for his arrest or anything like that for skipping probation. He does, but oh. they are not actively looking for him. Well, the other thing I wanted to know is how is he affording to stay in the hotels? And I mean, is he does he have a job? What's he I doing? I think they're I think they're doing a little petty theft and stealing and begging, begging. And, who knows? Yeah. Okay. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Well, I'm about to tell you everything you ever wanted to know, and it's not good. But after Tucker meets Mitchell, by the end of March of 2012, Tucker is telling Mitchell and Ian that he wants to kill a family. He wants specifically to rob and kill a family for cash to fuel his drug habit. And after this, he wanted to either go to Tennessee or Mexico. And when I read that, I thought, dude, those are two Totally different vibes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tennessee. Tennessee. Or Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. And according to his friend Ian, he talked about killing a family so much, everybody thought it was a joke. Man. Everybody thought he was just joking. Wow. When Tucker's birthday on April 5th rolls around, his 19th birthday, his dad posts on his Facebook page saying, Happy birthday call me. And his mother posts, I thought this was so sweet. (laughs) Quote, I tried texting and calling you. Grandma has a birthday present for you. Call me, love mom. End quote. They must be heartbroken. I mean, they're trying very hard, but I think they're also implementing a little bit of tough love. Sure. I think they gave him chance after chance after chance, and he took them all. And just took advantage of anything and everything that they did for him. And I'm sure it was hard to do tough love. It, it's always hard. You love your children. Yeah. It's very hard to dole out that tough love when you know it's what they need. And when you're telling your kid, this is breaking my heart as much as it's breaking yours. And they're like, sure. <laughs> yeah, just ask Santa Claus in Fred, in Fred Claus. <laughs> It's true. It is true. <laughs> Got to practice a little tough love. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna practice tough love on you, buddy. All right. Got to practice some tough love. <laughs> Ten days later, on the night of April fifteenth, twenty twelve, and into the wee morning hours of April sixteenth, Tucker, Mitchell, and Ian decide they're gonna put this plan into action. Hmm. Tucker tells them they can rob his parents' house because he thinks there's around. in there, and they can split it three ways. So Mitchell drives his truck to the Cipriano home because he knows there's a debit card. Tucker knows there's a debit card in his dad's car. Okay. And Mitchell waits in the car as Ian and Tucker break into the garage through an open window. I've also read that they broke a window, but I did read that it was an open window. He knew it was going to be open. He just raised it. They climbed through it, and then they started pilfering through the cars. Gotcha. They get Bob's Dearborn Federal Credit Union card. First, they go to a Valero station, a service station in Farmington Hills, and they try to withdraw $100 from the ATM, and they fail. 
Then they went inside and bought K2 in the convenience store using the debit card. No problem. Don't have to put a pin in. Right. And then they fill up Mitchell's truck with gas. Then they drive nine miles north to a mobile station in Kego Harbor, which is where Tucker's 15-year-old girlfriend, Samantha Chick, lives. And I'm sure they didn't have Bob's PIN number, so that's why they couldn't get the 100 bucks out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe he was taking a guess. And, you know, I was reading this one article, and it was like, how would he know his dad's pin? Yeah. Kids never know their parents' pins. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> My kids do. <laughs> It was your first mistake. Apparently. Yeah. No one's ever abused it, but they do. So, no. yeah. They're, they're trusting kids. Yeah. <laughs> so they end up in Kego Harbor, which is where Tucker's little girlfriend lives. They're mm-hmm. at this mobile station. They try to use the bank card again, and it doesn't work. They go to Tucker's girlfriend's house, and they talk through murdering a family. They're smoking their K2, and Tucker and Mitchell really start to map out and seriously talk about killing not just a family, but Tucker's family, the Ciprianos. Jeez. Now, I want to say that leading up to this, Tucker always talked about how he hated being adopted. Hmm. And even though his family, his parents didn't treat him any differently than the other three kids, he felt different. And I don't know... I have to give him that. I'm not adopted. I don't understand what that feels like. So, I mean, I'm sure he did feel different. Right. I think that they went to great lengths to make him very much one of the kids. Didn't matter if he was a biological child or not. Well, and too, I mean, it sounds like he's got some mental things going on. So if he was a little paranoid or depressed or whatever, I don't think they could have done anything to make him feel like he was a part of any more part of a family than he was. Well, I mean, they're taking him to psychologists and psychiatrists. You know, he's been, you know, he's got ADD. They've done everything that they can to help him. Sure. When he starts using drugs, she's going to meetings to figure out how to best care for her son. Yeah. And drug use for someone that's got any kind of emotional or mental problems can accelerate that terribly. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Rob. (laughs) But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Yeah. He's open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Absolutely. (laughs) I'm writing music the rest of the time. (laughs) But he feels different. I want to get back to my main point, that he does feel different. Right. And part of that is the Cipriano boys are tall. They're over six feet, and they're athletic, and they're popular, and they're smart. And, you know, he's shorter. He's like 5'8 or 5'9. And he doesn't feel adequate. He doesn't feel adequate, and he's a little bit of an outcast. Right. But I'm telling you now... If you didn't know he was a kid who'd done really bad things, it's hard not to think that he is cute. He's a handsome boy. Hmm. Tucker and Mitchell are both very handsome young men. Okay. But for Tucker, on top of feeling less than, he found out, apparently, that his birth mother, who I understand he had searched for, died just a few days before April 15th. Oh, really? The night that they are breaking into the garage and smoking spice. Wow. Now, according to Ian, Tucker and Mitchell come up with their, quote, batting order. Both of them discussed assignments about who would kill which members of the family. Hmm. Mitchell was supposed to take the parents, and Tucker was going to take his brothers. At this point, Mitchell volunteers to murder eight-year-old Isabella, oh little gosh. Belly. Wow. And according to Ian, this is the only moment that gave Tucker pause because he loved his little sister very much. Mm. So they rethink the plan to murder, and they go back to the Cipriano house, and Tucker climbs back through the window in the garage, and they find a gift card, like a Visa gift card. And it has a sticker on it that says there's $265 on the card. Okay. So they take this card and leave again. They drive back to his little girlfriend's house right. in Mitchell's truck. But once they're at the Chick's house, the last name is Chick, so it's possessive. <laughs> really? <laughs> they're also at the Chick's house because it's his girlfriend. <laughs> That's making me laugh. They discover the card only has... $2.65, not $265. So they decide they're going to use Bob's debit card one more time. And when they do, it comes up as blocked 
for suspicious purchases. Right. Banks will do that to you. Yep. It takes them a while because Rob and I have both had our debit <laughs> card stolen or... And actually, I've been in other states, you know, traveling, and all of a sudden, my debit card won't work, and I have to call the bank and say, hey, I'm in Florida. Yeah, it really is me. <laughs> it really is me. Yeah. So Tucker and Mitchell and Ian go back to this truck, and it's here that Tucker and Mitchell make their decision, okay, we're going for it. We're going to murder Tucker's family. Mm -hmm. But after all the chit-chat of who was doing what and killing who, I've seen an interview with Ian and he basically says, I'm out. Hmm. Quote, if they want to f*** their lives, they can do it, end quote. Wow. He didn't want to be brought into it. Sure. Ian tells them, drop me off at Tucker's girlfriend, at the chick's house, yeah. <laughs> at the chick's house, drop me off at Tucker's girlfriend's house in Kego Harbor. Hmm. He's been with them this whole night, but now he's like ta tapping out. Tap out? Yeah. I'm tapping yeah. out. And here's why. Tucker and Mitchell are deciding who's going to kill who, and they want Ian to drive the getaway car and then to dispose of the bodies in the Detroit River, but not before weighing them down with barrels of some sort. Good Lord. And Ian's like, yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I'll smoke the K2 with you. Yeah, yeah. I'll climb into your parents' garage and take a gift card worth $2.65. Maybe we buy some K2 on Bob's debit card, but now I'm done. Yeah. So at approximately 1.45 a.m. on April 16th, 2012, Tucker and Mitchell drop off Ian and they drive to the house a third and final time. Hmm. I'm surprised they didn't do something to Ian because he's the one that knows exactly what's going on. They're not thinking straight. I mean, yeah. they are high on yeah. this K2, on this spice stuff. Right. They arrive around 2.30 a.m., and with them, they have knives. The plan is to stab the family to death. So they go back through the window that they go had gone through before in the garage. They right. go through the garage where Tucker picked up an Easton baseball bat. Hmm. And when I read that, I was like, oh, my God. We have had so many Easton baseball bats <laughs> in our garage. Yeah. I think we still do. We probably do. <laughs> but he picks up this baseball bat and he opens the door from the garage to the house, to the mudroom, because it is not locked. Mm. And let me tell you, people, lock that door. I've had so many police officers say they might be able to get into your garage by, for some reason. Yeah. But don't let them in the house automatically because of that. So yep. lock that door. Yep. But before I get into this, I want to talk about the Cipriano family. Okay. It's April 15th, 2012. It's a Sunday, and the whole family went to church that day at St. Fabian Catholic Church in Farmington Hills. Good Italian Catholic family. <laughs> yeah. That night, Rose and eight-year-old Isabella went to bed around 930. Those are my people going to bed early. Mm-hmm. Bob watched TV in the front family room. But that's, 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 that's Rob. My, that's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> By 10.30 p.m., everybody in the house, including the two twins, Sal and Tanner, are in bed. It's a school night. Right. As Tucker and Mitchell open the door from the mudroom into the house, the family dog, Emmy, starts barking. Mm. And Emmy wakes up Bob, Tucker's dad. I also read that Emmy bit Tucker. Oh, wow. Somewhere in this exchange, the dog bites Tucker. Okay. Bob comes down the stairs. He's only got on his underwear. He's got on his boxer shorts. And he confronts his son, Tucker. He tells them, get out. Right. Now, who does what to whom is going to be dissected from here on out because there's going to be a whole lot of finger pointing going on. Okay. Tucker using the bat, attacked his father, hitting him in the head. Hmm. And when this happens, Mitchell asks him, what are you doing? And Tucker says, quote, join this or you will join them, end quote. Wow. Tucker then gave the bat to Mitchell and Tucker held his father while Mitchell continued to beat Bob with the bat. Jeez. And when Bob fell to the floor unconscious... Mitchell stood over him, continuing to beat him. Hmm. 
Now, while all this is happening, Tucker's mom, Rose, hears the initial get out of my house and comes running down the stairs. She's pleading with them both saying, quote, please stop. Please stop. I love you. I will give you whatever you want. Just stop. Just leave, end quote. Man. And that just broke my heart. Yeah. She is pleading. She's begging her son. Wow. Now, while Rose is pleading, little Isabella comes down the stairs. She sees what's happening. She goes to her room and gets another bat, her softball bat, which I believe is pink or rainbow colored. Hmm. She's giving it to her mother to defend herself, but it's taken away or dropped and Tucker picks it up and hands it to Mitchell, saying something to the effect of, shut her up, meaning his mom. Wow. So Mitchell beats Rose in the head with the softball bat. Ugh. Now, Sal, one of the twins at this point, he runs in. He sees what's happening. He goes and gets his pellet gun or BB gun. I've read it was both of those things. Okay. But when he's confronted by Tucker, Tucker beats Sal in the head with the baseball bat over and over, and he beats him, or Mitchell beats him, even with the butt end of the gun, until it breaks. Jeez. In a nearby bedroom, Tanner, the other twin, is getting a phone, and he's hiding. Okay. Tucker came into Tanner's bedroom looking for him, but Tanner hid under a desk, and the light was off in the room, and he can't see his brother hiding, and he yells back to Mitchell, quote, there's still one more, search the house, end quote. Man. Tanner calls 911. He tells the 911 operator that his brother and a friend are at the house beating his family. Mm. Tanner could also hear his little sister yelling, quote, I thought he loved me, Mom. Why is he doing this? End oh, quote. my gosh. Wow. And Rose said in her stupor, I mean, she's been beaten in the head, yeah. quote, I don't know. End quote. Jeez. Now, at some point during this, Tucker runs from the house. He hops in Mitchell's truck and he drives away, leaving Mitchell behind. Mm. Now, the police are on their way, lights flashing, sirens blaring. And when they arrive, the house is mostly dark. But through the front door, they can see Isabel standing in her nightgown. And at that point, Mitchell ran past her, knocked her down and goes running up the stairs. Now, the front door is locked, but Isabel opens it for the police. Yeah. They, she lets them in. They rush up the stairs, and they find Mitchell on the second floor. He's covered in blood. They order him down. They cuff him. Then more officers arrive. But it is carnage in this house. I'm sure. Bob is on the floor of the kitchen face down. Next to him is the pellet gun. The stock is completely broken off. Yeah. Wow. Bob Cipriano is dead. On the basement stairs is Rose. She's moaning. She's able to make sounds, but she can't really talk. She's out of it because she's been beaten in the head with a yeah. baseball bat. Right. Blood is spattered on the fridge, the cabinets, the ceiling. Ugh. There was blood puddled all throughout the first floor. There were bloody latex gloves on the second floor in the master bedroom. Hmm. Sal has been beaten so badly that he is completely unresponsive. Both of the bats are by his body. Jeez. Rose and Sal are rushed to the Botsford Hospital. The paramedics did not think Sal would make it. They thought he would be DOA. Uh -huh. But he was alive, barely. And when I say barely, the doctors had already called the transplant team to harvest Sal's organs. Really? That's how bad it was. Wow. The only two who were physically unharmed were Tanner and Isabella. And I say physically unharmed because they are mentally yeah. harmed for the yeah. rest of their life. Yeah, you don't go through something like that and, and come out on the other side okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the master bedroom, police find a safe. It's open with the key in the lock. Tanner will tell police his parents kept the safe there because Tucker was always stealing from them. Mm. Now, when police get their hands on Mitchell Young, they take him to a hospital because he has a dislocated jaw and injuries to his face and stomach and injuries caused by a baseball bat. Really? He tells police, I am a victim of Tucker, too. I didn't know he was going to murder his family. I didn't kill anyone. And I've seen this interview. 
he is hysterically crying to these police. Wah. <laughs> Wah is right. Yeah. Just wait. Okay. But police are after Tucker, who's driven Mitchell's truck back to his girlfriend's house, Samantha Chick, in Kego Harbor. Mm-hmm. And when Tucker arrives, he had blood on his shirt and a bite on his arm. And when she asked him, he said, the dog bit me. <laughs> so I'm thinking not when he came into the house did the dog bite him, but when he was beating yeah, yeah the owners with a baseball bat. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Scotty would do. Scotty, would you do that for us? <laughs> Be biting some ankles. <laughs> yeah, he would. He'd get some toes. <laughs> the way I read one article, there were a few people at the chick home that night, and no one wanted to ask Tucker where he'd been or what had happened to him. Hmm. Everybody just starts smoking more K2. <laughs> Tucker takes off his shirt. He tries to wash it. Then he falls asleep, but at some point he wakes up and Samantha had actually Googled Tucker's name on the internet and found the reports about the attacks on his family. Wow. Then he asked Samantha to get him some clothes and a knife from the truck, but before she could, the police show up and take Tucker into custody. There you go. I mean, they already know what happened and here's why. They have spoken with Tanner and Isabella as witnesses. They watch the whole thing unfold. Yeah. In the interrogation room, they question the boys separately. Right. Mitchell Young is crying hysterically throughout his interrogation. Tucker is calm. He's stoic even. And to no one's surprise, they point the finger at each other for the murders. (laughs) Right. And they're both going to change their stories of the events of that night more than once. But Tucker said Mitchell killed everyone, and Mitchell said Tucker was the killer. Hmm. Eventually, Mitchell tells Sergeant Richard Waby of the Farmington Hills Police Department that Tucker's dad confronted them both in the kitchen and told them to get out, and Tucker attacked his dad, and Mitchell yelled, quote, what the f*** are you doing, end quote. Then according to him, Mitchell, Tucker hit him with the bat and said, if you don't get with the program, you're going to join him. Wow. And it's at this point, Tucker handed him a bat and told him to shut up his mother. And Mitchell admitted he hit Rose in the head with the bat a couple of times. (laughs) Then Tucker and Sal fought after he showed up with the pellet gun. Tucker has a story too, by the way. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. (laughs) Yeah. He tells police that Mitchell attacked both his mother and his father. Tucker admits that he held his father from behind while Mitchell hit him with the bat. Then Mitchell hit Rose, his mother, with the bat when she came downstairs. Then he says he left the scene to hide Isabella away, telling her not to come out. (laughs) He tells police that he knew Tanner was hiding upstairs and he pretended not to know where he was for his own protection. He admits that, yes, when Sal showed up with his pellet gun, he hit him with the bat in the head, and then he went into the bathroom and he threw up. Okay. So quite a different story. Yeah. And the problem is they have Tanner and Isabella, for goodness sake. I know. I mean, they've got a an eyewitness times two, and they're still trying to make up stories. I mean, Well, <laughs> yeah. one, Isabella sees way more than Tanner. Tanner sees what's happening goes upstairs, and while all the fighting and the beating is happening, he's on the phone to 911. Right, okay. Saying, please hurry, please hurry. Right. Yeah. But later, they're both going to recant these confessions or statements and say they were given under duress. Mitchell was on painkillers and handcuffed to a hospital bed. And Tucker was in high school when he waived his Miranda rights and gave his statement. He's a kid. Yeah. I don't know any better. I didn't know I should have wa- shouldn't have waived my Miranda rights. Oh, jeez. I mean, you know they're watching Law and Order. Everybody's watching Law and yeah. Order. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's a lawyer. <laughs> they are both charged with first degree premeditated murder, first degree felony murder, two counts of assault with intent to murder, and armed robbery. Rose was in a coma for two weeks. Jeez. She has a closed head injury. She's going to need rehab. Wow. 
Sal survived, but will spend months in the hospital before being sent to rehab. Mm. He couldn't talk, he could not walk, and he had a feeding tube. Jeez. When it's time for the trial, Rose asks the prosecutor's office to offer Tucker and Mitchell a plea deal, 40 to 50 years. It was long enough to take them into their old age, but not life without parole. She also wanted the plea deal so her family wouldn't have to testify and relive Hmm. the night of April 16th. Sure. Okay. Bob's brother, Greg, comes to Michigan. He's an attorney in New Jersey. Greg is not happy. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the wrong person to mess with. He's not happy. He's not happy with Tucker, but he's not happy that his sister-in-law has asked for this, has asked for this plea deal. And the prosecution office is pushing forward with the case. It's a high profile case. This is the kind of case that makes careers and stars out of attorneys. And the assistant DA, Jessica Cooper, wanted to take this case to trial. Side note, it was going to be the very first trial, I believe in Michigan, but for sure in Detroit, that was going to be on TV. Oh, wow. So she's smelling blood in the water. Yeah. 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 I mean, she wants to be a star. She wants to be the next uh, Marsha Clark. Clark. Marsha Clark. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Oh, wow. But Rose believed, listen, Jessica Cooper's not thinking about us or anybody else. She's thinking about her career. She was not thinking about the trauma of her family. Right. And when Jessica Cooper moved forward, Rose went to the media and said, quote, Cooper wants a big trial. We are being assaulted a second time. Only this time, it's by Jessica Cooper, end wow. quote. That's a tough place to be in. That is really, I mean, good for her Yeah, for using the media to say, we're trying to give them an out. Yep. These are kids. It's sensational. You're just going to put my family through hell one more time. Sure. Meanwhile, Uncle Greg is talking to Tucker in jail, asking him to plead guilty so the family won't have to relive the night. To which Tucker says, quote, I feel disrespectful for saying this, but I feel that fighting for the rest of my life is the only thing I have, the only option I have left. Giving up is like hanging myself. Um, oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. He goes on to say, that's what it feels like to me, end quote. Hmm. And his uncle Greg said, quote, well, your dad paid for it with his life. Yeah. And if you have any hope whatsoever of redemption of your soul, you will do something, end quote. And Tucker replied, quote, Greg, don't come at me like that, end quote. Wow. So he kind of wants to go to trial. Yeah. I mean, he's going to blame it on Mitchell. He's going to blame it on Roderick. (laughs) Right. But what Uncle Greg could not do, his brother Tanner did accomplish. So Tanner goes, he meets with Tucker and says, quote, the biggest moment of your life could be right now. It could be deciding that this trial could be about forgiveness, taking responsibility and loving each other. Right. What is more meaningful to me is that you take responsibility for the first time in your life just like dad always wanted you to, Hmm. end quote. Wow. To which Tucker replied, quote, this opened my eyes and broke my heart. I feel like it's the only way I will be able to express my love for the family enough. I'm taking responsibility. You know, I'm sorry for being the way that I did. You know, I love you and I'm very proud of you, end quote. Jeez. Days later, Tucker keeps his word, and while the jury is waiting to begin the trial and the assistant DA is foaming at the mouth, (laughs) he entered a plea of no contest, which is considered the same as guilty for sentencing processes. Sure. But he didn't admit that he did it, and he didn't say that he didn't do it. Right. He will die in prison after receiving life without the possibility of parole. Tucker accepted responsibility for his version of that night. Mitchell isn't going down without a fight. Mm. And when he pressed them on it, they went to trial. 
Okay. And they pulled the DNA card. Okay. It was discovered that both bats used were covered in blood. DNA from the Quest bat, that's the little softball bat, matched right. Sal and Rose. Okay. But Mitchell's DNA wasn't on it. The Easton bat, Rose, Sal, and Bob's DNA was on it. Mitchell's DNA couldn't be excluded mm. as DNA, okay. as a DNA donor. But right. Tucker's DNA was excluded on that bat. Really? Yes. Wow. When Mitchell is arrested, he had blood on his hands, his face, his clothes, blood that matched DNA for Rose, Bob, and Sal. Hmm. And the blood spatter expert comes in and says the blood on Mitchell's pants was consistent with impact splatter. Splatter that showed he was standing over the blood source or the victims. Wow. He's so close there was blood spatter up the inseams of his pants. Gosh. Like he's standing over, he's he's straddling them and striking them with the bat. Man. They did not find that on Tucker's clothes. Mm. Tucker's clothes were basically the same, everybody's blood, but he did not have impact blood spatter. And Tucker's clothes had Rose and Sal's DNA, but not his dad, Bob. Okay. Now... As far as Mitchell's injuries, well, the ER doctor said the injuries were severe enough to be from Tucker hitting him with a bat. His injuries, though, were more in line with him having a struggle with Bob. Bob, who runs triathlons. Bob, yeah. who runs marathons. Bob, right. who plays in a basketball league, in a softball league. Bob was buff, and he fought back. And they're saying that's... That's what those injuries were. That's where he got them. Okay. That's where Mitchell's injuries came from. Makes sense. And who testifies against Mitchell? But the good old BFF, Ian. <laughs> he gets immunity to tell his story because he was there for the other two break-ins, but not the murder. Right. And because Ian was believable, the family didn't even need to testify. Hmm. At Mitchell's sentencing, he takes this opportunity He's already been found guilty, right? Right, right. Guilty of murder. He's right. getting ready to be sentenced. And instead of saying he was sorry, he takes the opportunity to tell the judge everything that was wrong with his attorney and his case when he's given this chance to speak. Wow. He, too, is sentenced to life without parole. And the judge said, quote, your refusal to take any responsibility is un." believable, end quote. <laughs> Good for him. I mean, even after he berated his attorney, his attorney is standing next to him. He's like going, he has this list of all the things that were wrong in his trial and that his attorney didn't represent him well. And after he finished and when the judge stopped him, his attorney just looks at him and says, I have no, I'm, this is a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he doesn't have words, but he just finally says something to the effect of, this is a, he's a disgrace. Wow. This is a disgrace. Wow. Mitchell will make a formal appeal in December of 2014. His conviction is upheld. As for the Ciprianos, Tanner graduated valedictorian, went on to Notre Dame and graduated. Sal had a long road to go, but he is now walking. He still doesn't talk. He texts to communicate. Mm -hmm. Isabella graduated from high school. So did Sal. I read that that happened at about the same time. Okay. Isabella went on to Notre Dame on scholarship, and I read she wants to be a doctor. Good. Now, there's a 5K charity run to help with the expenses and medical bills and needs of Sal. I will put a link to the charity in the show notes. They run this 5K every year, and I believe Sal has even been able to run Walk It now. Oh, good. Tucker is serving his life sentence. I do not know if he is in contact with his family or not. Yeah. But that is the story, the tragic story of the Cipriano family. And that's all I have to say about that. You know, I just don't even know how you would recover. I mean, emotionally, yeah, yeah, just physically, emotionally, yeah. And you think about the mom, I mean, the fact that your your own child, I know he was adopted, but he was still I mean, they child. had him from the time he was four days old. Yeah. That's your child. Yeah. And uh, the fact that he tried to kill you and he killed your husband. 
I mean, I, I don't know. The whole thing is just And so, almost killed his brother. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'd have to, like, second-guess yourself at every turn. But this family, honestly, did everything they could for this kid. Yeah. They were really trying hard to make this kid's life good for him. Right. He didn't, you know, because Mitchell, Mitchell did have a tough life. Right. And he never had any, he had never been picked up for anything. Nothing. Wow. Until the, the murders that night. Amazing. And Tucker had all those, you know, little, you know, possession of, DUI, you know, whatever. Sure. You could kind of see that one coming. With Mitchell, it kind of came out of out of left field. Right. And, of course, they blame the K2. They blame being high. Yeah. And it made him nuts. Well, he's in jail, and so They is both Mitchell. are in jail. And, yep. And, and will be there for the rest of their lives without the possibility of parole. And that's a good thing. It is a good thing. They both look very vastly different. I will show pictures of them because when they go into jail, when they are picked up right after the murders, Mm -hmm. they look like such kids, like two young boys, nice looking kids. And now they just, they look like guys who've been in prison for 10 years. You were boys, nice boys. They were nice boys. Nice boys. (laughs) Except maybe for you. And now... They look like they've been in prison for 10 years. All right. It's sad. Yeah. Well, let's move on from that. And yes. Do something a little lighter, like a little bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. All right. This week's bless your hearts. Let's start with number one. I'm calling it free beer. <laughs> Don't say that too loud. Yeah. Undercover police officers hunted down suspects who had evaded arrest from crimes ranging from burglary to serious sexual assault, <gasps> etc., by luring them with a promise of free beer. Come on in, guys. Yeah, yeah. The officers sent letters to dozens of people asking them to call a marketing company to receive a free crate of beer. Oh. With 19 suspects falling for the hoax and calling back. <laughs> but. That's genius, actually. Yeah, yeah, but they were actually being put through to the Chesterfield Police Station. Told to agree a date and time for the booze to be dropped off, they were instead met by police and promptly arrested. And what's the moral of the story? Don't drink beer. I don't know. What is the moral? Nothing in life is free. There you go. (laughs) Sorry. I don't know. There's no free beer in life. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay, number two. Who actually has the bird brain? Me? (laughs) No, not you. In 2006, police were able to track down a bird thief after the pair he (gasps) stole managed to leave them a vital clue. He stole birds? Mm-hmm. Okay. Tristan Maidment, that's the name, stole Mickey the macaw from a local pet shop. Oh! I know. Though Maidment said he didn't remember doing it. An obviously <laughs> <K-2>. irate... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An obviously irate Mickey the macaw bit him during the struggle, leaving a trail of blood that police were able oh. to use to obtain a DNA match. I was hoping you were going to say that the bird was like, he's in here. He's in here. (laughs) I'm being held hostage. Help me. Isn't there like a, I've seen a video where the police show up, the guy's outside working on his truck (laughs) because there's somebody going, help, help Help me. me. And he brings out his bird and it's his bird (laughs) saying, help me, help me. Because the police came in and, you know, they get into the driveway and, you know, they got their hands on their holster. Yeah, and yeah, asking, yeah. And he's like, it's my bird. It's the bird. Let me go get him. And they brought him out. And the police just started laughing. If we had a bird, it would that would say something. They're hurting me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Mickey's owner was not surprised by his parrot's crime-fighting act. He was described the bird as being notoriously bad-tempered. <laughs> That one's got a bad temper. You got to watch out for that (laughs) one. Exactly. All right, number three, and finally, in deep, deep (laughs) doo-doo. Okay. In 2009, a drunk driver really put his foot in it after dog poo footprints led (laughs) North Carolina police directly to him. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. Yep. Okay. Tipsy teenager Jose Heros. Cornilla. Nice. Nicely done. Thank you. Drove his black Camaro on the wrong side of the road before crashing into the garden of a dog lover. 
that'll that'll do it. Yep, yep, yep. Police attending the scene discovered crushed bushes, a damaged fence, a wrecked car, and a fresh shoe print in a pile of dog do. <laughs> How big's the dog? I know, geez. <laughs> Tracing a whifty trail down the street. <laughs> That's a big dog. <laughs> yeah, the cops noticed a white van driving toward them. Okay. <laughs> when they asked the passenger to step out, they noticed the smell of alcohol in the man's breath and evidence all over his shoes. The smell on his shoe, the smell of the evidence <laughs> on his shoes, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what? He was promptly arrested. <laughs> it was, and then when they go back to the garden, the woman walks out. She's got a mastiff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He knew. Yeah. Way the, to go. The size of a small horse. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. <laughs> good job, Ox. <laughs> There's your bless your hearts. That's good. Those are good. No, nah, thank you. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing, all yep. you have to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where there's a pull down menu. Mm -hmm. Fill out the form. While you're there, you can also suggest a case. Right. And don't forget about the new form to tell us about your brush with true crime. Your brush with true crime. <laughs> Ah, we did one last week. Yep. Next week is Valentine's Day. We're into February. Yep. Next week's Valentine's Day. We're going to do a Valentine's Day homicide. Of course we are. <laughs> of course we are. Blood red. That's, so get your roses and your candy ready for it. Yep. That's my amazing husband out there. That's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. <laughs> Bye, y'all. 